Greetings, uh, I'm David uh, Beberstorff, University of Missouri. I am a professor in radiology, neurology, and psychological sciences. I'm also the William and Nancy Thompson now chair of radiology. I am a uh, fellowship trained and certified cognitive and behavioral neurologist and run a memory disorders clinic at the University of Missouri in addition to doing work with adults in the autism spectrum. All right. Thanks, David. And I, I'm Dr. Ryan Townley, and I'm an assistant professor in neurology at the University of Kansas. Um, I'm the medical director of our uh, memory care clinic and also the fellowship director of our behavioral and cognitive neurology fellowship. And I am also uh, UCNS uh, trained in, in fellowship and certified uh, as well. So we've both been asked to discuss this paper, White Matter Intensity Trajectories in Patients with Progressive and Stable Mild Cognitive Impairment. Uh, this was put together by a team up at McGill led by Dr. Kamal. What they did was looked at the data set from the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. Uh, it's a large data set. They looked at 820 samples from this. Uh, and what they tracked was uh, amyloid positive versus negative individuals, those that had such data documented, and looked at progressors versus stable. So they had four different groups, amyloid positive progressors, amyloid negative progressors, uh, amyloid positive stable, and amyloid negative stable. Uh, tracking over six years well, allowed them to really get a good longitudinal picture of this. Of course, though, it is a retrospective look as it's coming from the data set. They also monitored other factors that might influence progression, such as APOE4 status. What they found was that the amyloid uh, negative stable had the lowest degree of white matter hyperintensities uh, compared to the other groups, in particular, the two amyloid positive groups. And also that the amyloid positive progressors uh, had the greatest degree of change in white matter and the amyloid negative stable, at least a, a fairly unsurprising finding. And hypertension was found to be the critical impacting factor as you can see, the amyloid beta negative for really all the brain regions uh, looked at with a little bit less uh, clarity in the occipital lobe had the lowest uh, degree of white matter baseline uh, uh, change. And as you can see, they have the amyloid beta progressor group had the greatest change over time in the amyloid beta, amyloid beta negative stable group had the least. So uh, I'd like to pass off my colleague, Dr. Townley, and uh, for his comments on this study, and also to ask the really critical question, why is it us cognitive behavior neurologists are so obsessed with mild cognitive impairment? <laughs> yeah, thanks, David. So, so yeah, that's a good summary uh, of the paper. And I, I, I did want to, it's good to pause just to kind of, yeah, kind of define what do we mean when we say mild cognitive impairment, because that that is the group of folks that we're looking at in this uh, paper. And so, so essentially what we mean by that is we see changes, right, on the cognitive testing more than we would expect for normal aging. So they're in sort of percentiles below what we would expect for normal aging, uh, but it might not yet be impacting their day-to-day -day activities. So they're, uh, you know, they're still independent with their daily activities, but we certainly see changes. And um, yeah, so we're, we're really focused on that because that's like the earliest stages of a lot of these diseases, right? And so we think that if we could find folks in those stages earlier, we could make a bigger impact on slowing progression, right? Um, or at least identifying potentially contributing causes. Because uh, as, as, as you know, right, when we're seeing patients in the clinic, not all mild cognitive impairment is, is created equal, right? There are multiple different uh, contributors to that. And um, there's a lot of reversible ones, actually, that we're like heavily looking for when we're seeing patients. So a big one that I feel like is often overlooked is sleep apnea, right? So that one can, can absolutely have an, an impact on cognition. We see hearing loss uh, be, be a, a major contributor. Medication side effects, right? So you see like anything that is depressing the central nervous system, you think of like benzodiazepines or opiates, but then anticholinergics are a really big one, right? So things like oxybutynin and many other over-the-counter sleep aids have anticholinergic effects. Um, and then there are obviously medical conditions, psychiatric diseases, right? Depression, anxiety, all these can have an impact on cognition. Um, but, you know, in, in reality, right, a lot of what we see, especially if it's short-term memory, is sort of an early stage of something happening in the brain. Uh, and, and that's where we can start to use cognitive tests to try to differentiate, hey, do we think this is an early 
Alzheimer's process? Is this maybe an early vascular process or the other types of neurodegenerative diseases we see? And part of why we try to focus on those causes is because it's so heterogeneous of who's going to convert to from that mild cognitive impairment stage to dementia. Um, and, and so we, we, we roughly quote somewhere between five and 15%, uh, some will say five to 10% of mild cognitive impairment to dementia per year, right? Um, but trying to predict that is really difficult. Uh, and, and so that's where this type of paper is really, really nice to see, hey, can we add some things in our toolbox that can help us predict that? The trick is also some of them don't uh, progress and it's really hard to know who the heck they are. And it really would be fantastic to know. Uh, this does create some guidance for imaging markers, uh, but uh, the key is what can you do about it? And that's why we were particularly intrigued when they seemed to point to uh, the hypertension as a risk factor. Of course, we've known that for uh, a while because uh, all the cardiovascular risk factors uh, seem to increase the risk of uh, development of dementia. Uh, and it's almost as if it's a, another form of metabolic syndrome, uh, metabolic syndrome of the brain. And so modifiable risk factors are of huge uh, importance. Uh, there have been a lot of studies. I recently wrote a little review on these. Uh, and it seems that uh, the 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 big uh, impact is if you are doing prevention, uh, their uh, control of your cardiovascular risk factors, uh, Mediterranean dash mind diet approaches, basically cardiovascular protective diets, uh, and also uh, things like omega-3 fatty acids, which are in these diets. Uh, so and I, I, my suspicion is that when it comes down to it, that these have a synergistic effect. And hopefully if you can implement a bunch of them together, it can have a meaningful impact. Unfortunately, once the condition has developed, once dementia has developed, certainly the impact of these is much, much less. Uh, and that may to be to some extent true also for mild cognitive impairment, although it is certainly better than it is with uh, dementia. But these uh, vascular factors, uh, uh, at least leave an imaging trace uh, here that seems to point in this direction. However, I don't know that this particular setting uh, would provide us uh, a definitive answer who's gonna progress, but it does uh, certainly provide some uh, bit of a leaning in that direction. Yeah, what I, what I liked about this paper too, is it it didn't look at just general, you know, just overall, you know, white matter burden, which is basically evidence of um, we, we use some scales to try to quantify. There's lots of different scales out there, like the Fazika scale or some other types of scales. But um, this really tried to look at, well, could we look at different regions of the brain? So it looked at the frontal lobe and temporal lobe and parietal lobe and occipital lobe and um, tried to see, well, maybe we could help try to quantify that a little bit better to see um, if it could, could give us any indication of impact. And uh, um, there's been a couple other studies that sort of mirror this one, which really does look at these patterns, right? Or the topography of, of vascular disease. And it it does seem to be consistent with both this study and, uh, and a similar study that, um, you know, when we see the posterior or kind of like right around the, the parietal lobes and occipital lobes, uh, white matter changes, those folks are usually more likely to be amyloid positive, right? So uh, they, they're, they're more likely to have positive amyloid PET scans indicating amyloid plaques and, um, those folks also tend to have a little bit more amyloid angiopathy related. So cerebral amyloid angiopathy related changes, which, which has its own impact on vascular disease. And, uh, and, and I think it, it's, I think it's really helping us move forward of, of not just looking at global burden, but really can we better pinpoint where in the brain that's occurring? And does that give us an indication of what might be contributing to it? Right. There are certainly some things that we're kind of, uh, missing here, uh, uh, one is uh, what type of vascular disease and certainly more broadly, what type of non-Alzheimer's condition uh, was present. Uh, but even within the vascular disease for these recruiter infarcts, amyloid angiopathy, small vessel changes, it was just more of a carpet uh, question of degree of white matter change. Uh, again, uh, the relationships with APOE uh, could have been more deeply explored in the number of copies. Uh, tau was not explored uh, in this uh, setting. Uh, they were certainly reasonably focused on one, one thing, and that was amyloid. Uh, and 
again, the the big question is uh, that they can't answer at this stage uh, is can you Im improve this? Is hypertension simply a risk factor or is this a modifiable risk factor? Uh, that will be important going forward. Uh, and do other treatment uh, approaches impact this in any way, uh, which is becoming much more of an important thing now that we have targeted amyloid therapies. Uh, to be totally honest, uh, in, my, uh, in my past practice, we really did, we, we did not have uh, a way of uh, paying for uh, amyloid PET scans and uh, spinal fluid studies were a bit of a burden on a patient as well. So, and there was not blood tests at that point in time. So we did not aggressively pursue the pathological subtype because in most cases we were gonna likely give it a try to give them the cholinesterase inhibitors and NDA antagonists, in addition to try to treat and, mo and look at all the modifiable risk factors that we could. Uh, but now we do need to approach that and look at these biomarkers. Uh, and this could have uh, potentially interesting implications uh, in what these white matter hypertensities mean in these uh, patients. Um, so this could have some implications for practice. Uh, but uh, I think you know, trying to uh, minimize any uh, contributing factor and uh, improve the course of those things and maximize uh, approaches that uh, could improve cognition, like uh, improving the hearing, as you mentioned earlier in one of your slides, uh, mental, physical, social activity seem to have a beneficial effect uh, in addition to appropriate therapies to try to maximize treatment. It'll be interesting to see how these interact going forward. Um, any further thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I like the, there's a lot of pathways to, to branch out from this paper. Um, one of the things, yeah, when you mentioned the APOE4, uh, it, it does have a major impact on this, right? So if you look at kind of just the subgroups themselves, right? So we talked about how there's four groups that A beta positive, so the amyloid beta positive group, um, really, uh, when you look at the progressors, about almost 70% of them were or it had at least one APOE4 allele, right? Uh, and then the amyloid positive stable group, about 54% of them did, right? And so, so you're already above 50% in that group compared to like the amyloid negative progressors, it was like 9% and the amyloid uh, negative stable folks, it was 18%, right? So you can almost like go down the list of that. Are they amyloid positive or not? How likely are they to have APOE, right? There's, there's a d direct relationship there. And then I think if we could, look more at like how many of them have two copies of APOE4, but we would see that pattern even emerge. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and, and and maybe that would start to link up a little bit more with that cerebral amyloid angiopathy type, right? When we talk about those different subtypes of, uh, of vascular disease. But um, another thing I saw that was a little interesting in this, you know, we, we think of, I think it's important to think of uh, Alzheimer's disease as more of a continuum, right? Uh, you know, we always kind of in the past have equated it with dementia, but right, we, we're sort of defining this mild cognitive impairment stage. There's also sort of the pre-symptomatic stages where patients can be amyloid positive for many years and not have cognitive changes, right? Um, but age is the biggest risk factor there, right? And so when you look at the amyloid beta negative stable group, they were actually about four years younger than the other groups. And so you almost wonder, is there an age effect here as well? Um, but those will be, that's what's really nice about these longitudinal studies. We'll be able to follow those folks more um, and, and see if there's a, a relationship over time. Well, one of the tricks of the longitudinal study is always, is the patient that looks like they have a particular risk factor or a dietary protective factor, is it really that dietary factor or is it the fact that they're also doing a whole bunch of other healthy things? <laughs> that's, that, that, it becomes difficult to disentangle. So one yeah. does need to approach it in a, in a, uh, in a uh, more targeted uh, manner in the future. But nonetheless, uh, this is an interesting step forward. And I hope that in the future, we can gain a better understanding of who with mild cognitive impairment is most likely to progress and why and what the heck we can do about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was, there, was, there was one other thing I, I wanted to mention too, because you brought up the idea of tau, right? So we haven't really, this paper doesn't, if you search tau in the in the paper, right, it's not uh, all throughout the paper because they were specifically looking at that amyloid and vascular relationship. But, you know, in the clinic, when we're seeing patients, what ties most to cognitive change over time is tau burden. Um, and uh, 
And, and I think that that'll be an interesting thing to follow over time. There was actually a, a paper just published in the last few weeks that, um, so this was the interactions between vascular burden and amyloid beta pathology, just like this paper, but also trajectories of tau accumulation. And uh, and what they kind of found is, yeah, it seemed to be the low bar microbleeds, you know, what we typically see in amyloid angiopathy, seemed to have the biggest impact on both baseline tau and the longitudinal tau accumulation more than the other types of vascular disease. So again, just another reason why it's probably going to be important to disentangle what is causing the vascular disease, right? Because uh, um, that might have an this impact. Tangle on... you said, I, I noted. <laughs> <laughs> pun pun uh, intended, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, so yeah, I think I think you know it's really exciting in in our field, right? In, in cognitive behavioral neurology, because it's we're we're just now trying to get all these different aspects. You know, we're going to have we've got the amyloid and tau biomarkers we can now assess, right? And and we're as you alluded to doing more of that in the clinic now. Um, but then we're going to have vascular, you know, uh, we'll we'll have vascular biomarkers, and then probably subtyping those a little bit further as we learn more about this. And I think that's that's what's really exciting when you think it down at the independent, uh, you know, at the, at the patient level, right? Um, uh, okay. When you think of personalized medicine, it, as we start to to get more information about this with these um, really important uh, registries like the ADNI data set uh, and other data sets similar um, across the, the country and the world, we're, we're going we're gonna to learn more about, yeah, what are those predictors of progression? Because that that is, as you said earlier, is the most frustrating part of our job is we we don't really have a crystal ball of when we diagnose someone, hey, this is kind of what the next three to five years might look like, right? And um, as, as we uh, fine tune that more at an individual level, I think that'll really help um, with our uh, prognosis uh, related questions we always get asked. Fantastic. Well, thanks for this uh, excellent discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out.